Just give a big hand to yourselves for being here. Let's just kind of wake up and good morning, and here we are. Awesome. Stuart. So, well, first to say um, I've never done a dialogue before. My work is not usually about talking about stuff. I usually do experiences and get you into trouble. Um, so I have no idea what I'm doing here in a certain way. I'm here mostly because um, I'm impressed with you. I think this is your forte and to have an opportunity to be with you in a form like this I felt would serve. I think I'm not sure of, uh, of the parts that I exactly have to add from a conceptual place, although I do have a lot of conceptual ideas. So having said all of that, repeat the question you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> give, just give us whatever your take is on the future of love and sex. Where are we going? I'll, I'll tell you, it's <laughs> we're going into more of it. Uh, but <laughs> what I think, dropping to a bottom line, is that we put a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of time into achieving orgasms. And like the function of sex is to come. And I think uh, when you think about it, it only lasts about 30 seconds. If you push it, maybe 45. Um, but I think that what sex is about is what I would call foreplay. It's about all of the stuff that leads up to that. It's the touching, it's the hugging, it's the connection, it's the love, it's the looking in the eyes, it's the, it's the... So I think the whole focus needs to come off the goal of having it end in a certain way. The focus needs to be a goal of having it go on forever. Mm. I'm finished. Mm. <laughs> awesome. So l let me just, you know, I'm just gonna kind of pick up the ball Why where, not? where Stuart you know, kind of left it. And Stuart puts an image on the table, which is an image of sex that lasts forever, <laughs> which sounds like a great place to begin a conversation. <laughs> now, Stuart, of course, points out implicitly that an orgasm that lasts forever might get painful, right? I mean, at some point, right? Well, you, wa you want it, yeah? Is that okay? Is that a fair well, point? Well, only if it's genital, but if it's a body orgasm, maybe it's not so painful. Which, of course, <laughs> begins, begins really where the conversation has to go. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute, view my job as, we're gonna do this like the ancient text did. So, just kidding, getting a sense spontaneously in the moment, Stuart's gonna be the, the body of the sacred text, and I'm gonna be the commentary. <laughs> so, Stuart just put out a couple of sutras, right? A couple of <laughs> verses. Right? And one was the image of sex that lasts forever. And two was a short orgasm. And three was the expansion of orgasm beyond the genitals. So those are the three sutras that Stuart, I did all of that. You did all of that. <laughs> <laughs> those are the three holy sutras that God, Stuart put in the room. I'm really good. <laughs> and, and the last thing that he put in the room, which is the fourth sutra, which was his addition in a later you know, it was probably added, you know, 200 years later and <laughs> interpolated into the text was the famous statement, which was, God, comma, I'm really good. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to be working with all four of those. <laughs> and I want to start with, you know, the expansion of orgasm, right? Because I think that's really a great place to start. Let's just start with the word, okay? The word orgasm has different etymologies, but one of them, right, probably is from Hebrew, which is or mugzam, orgasm or light, mugzam, extreme light, <laughs> radical light. What a wonderful play, right? That is to say, orgasm is a kind of radical light that the structures of this world have a very hard time holding, right? Which is why sexuality is viewed as so dangerous, right? Because in order to participate in orgasm, you've gotta let something go. You can't hold on to your classical image of your small self. Your skin encapsulated, carefully controlled ego has to kind of loosen the reins. And something needs to emerge that's different. Which is why orgasm is or mugzam, it's extreme light. That is to say, orgasm is subversive. I want to offer that into the space. Orgasm is subversive. Sex is subversive. Right? In its essential core, Stuart. Well, define subversive. Sub 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 
Good plan, okay? <laughs> okay, so then the major text says to find subversive. So let's do it. Subversive means <laughs> that it undermines the core way that we expect society to work. So let me give you an example, and then I'll throw it back at you. And again, at any moment, interrupt, take it in a different direction. I'll just kind of work with the interpretation. Let me just stay with the definition of subversive and throw it back to you. So here's a good example. You go to the bank. How many people here have bank accounts? OK, we're going to be doing a collection later, so don't pretend that's <laughs> not true. That's not true. I'm just making that shit up. OK, so, so go to your bank, and you ask your teller, hey, I'd like to withdraw $200. You take $200 out, and then you tell the teller, do me a favor, don't debit my account, credit my account. Ha <laughs> ha, they, they look at you like that was funny. Now, you'll either get thrown out immediately, or in about 20 minutes, depending on how large your account is. But eventually, you're thrown out of the bank. Because we all know, you're taking money out of the account, or you're giving money into the account, and that essential distinction between giving and receiving is the structure that all politics, all economics are based on. Now in Kabbalah, we have something that we call, and it exists in Kajmer Shaivism and Sufism, it exists in Vajrayana ta Tantra, right? You know, it's called Sodhana Shikin. Oh, well, that's clear. The secret, <laughs> the secret, the secret of the kiss. And what's the nature of a kiss? In a kiss, giving and receiving are the same. There's no distinction. The giver is the receiver. The receiver is the giver. And the entire distinction that the entire core structure of society is based on, the distinction, are you being a giver or a receiver, breaks down and actually evaporates in the sexual. The sexual holds a vision of reality in which, in fuck, there is no distinction between giving and receiving. And to expand, and I'm going to go two more sentences, and pass it back to Stuart because I want to cover a second one of the sutras. To expand the sexual beyond the genitals, to expand it to the whole body, really we want to go a third step. We want to expand the sexual beyond the body. We actually want to expand fuck beyond what we normally call fucking. We actually want to experience and realize that fuck is the inner nature of all of reality in every moment that actually every moment of reality, you're either going to let that moment penetrate you and fuck you open and then reveal the eternity that resides in that moment, or you're going to penetrate the moment and fuck the moment open right, and release and liberate right, the fullness of presence that's in that moment, or that moment will remain closed. Right? And so that's the, that's the invitation. Yes. Yes, sister. So that, that's the invitation, though, and it's an exciting invitation. And the truth is we'd all clap if we would just let ourselves fuck. But we're here being a little controlled, right? So one person said, yes, yes, yes. Like, but, but actually, we know that. We actually know that, right? And when we exile fuck to the sexual, last sentence, when we exile fuck to the sexual, then fuck collapses under the burden of a weight that it can't possibly bear. Because fuck, or eros, right, has got to live in all of our non-sexual lives. And when we ask the sexual to bear the burden of our erotic fuck nature, then sex collapses. So we have to be fucking everywhere. And that's what Stuart implied. We need to expand <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> we need to expand. Boy, I'm good. <laughs> We've moved from God to boy. We're, just, we're watching the text carefully. So that, that's just a beginning of the conversation, but it's a frame. And that's a frame, and it's, it's a deep frame for what the future right, of sex, love, right, might be. Wow. Um, I should say something. Well, you, you could do a practice. <sighs> Let me just stay with Please. A, the part of this that... Um, this is going to definitely blow my image, but I have some trouble with the word fuck. Um, in a sense, I think you use it the way what I'm interpreting that you're saying is that you're using it instead of the word eros. 
I'm using in this context fuck and eros to mean the same thing. I mean the same thing. Yes. Then I like it. Awesome. Um, because I think, I think that eros is about passion, it's about opening your heart, it's about connection. Somehow fuck to me is about sexual, it's about genitals, you know. Right. Whereas I think that when we really get down to it and we're really in touch with anything that gives us enormous pleasure, it isn't genital, right? You know, it's connection. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And connection will produce heightened genital pleasure. Heightened genital pleasure sometimes can produce connection, right? But mostly, it needs the connection first. And I think, in some ways, in my experiences, it's a, it's the difference with men and women. I mean, uh, women need the the connection and open their hearts to have sex, and men need the sex to open to open their hearts, you know. Um, and there's a place to come together that I believe um, in, in a way needs to learn that it doesn't work unless the heart's involved. I mean, it works in terms of release, but it doesn't work in terms of having any depth of meaning and of what we're looking for. And however you call about us, but to walk in the world in this open place that's connected and in love and sees the person that you're having sex with or having eros with the person that you're having sex with, you can have bliss. You can have what, everything that you're looking for. And it doesn't, it doesn't last a short time. Yeah. And it lasts beyond the experience. Yeah. Beautiful. So, so let, me, let me pick up, Stuart. On, yeah, go. On, on, there's two things and two parts of what you talked about, and each one is so large. So I want to just say something about the second, which I want to return to, but uh, I want to focus on the first part of what you said. Let me just say I love the way you do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Stuart talks about you know the heart, and I would just kind of define what sex is: is the body loving. So I want to really make that really clear, right? In my lexicon and understanding, and you know, I've, I've footnoted this, but let's not footnote it now, right? What sex is is the body loving. The notion of sex without love doesn't exist in my lexicon. Now, the body loving could be a 30-year relationship, or it might be a two-hour relationship, but in both of them, love has to be absolutely present. So the notion that actually there's a possibility right, of authentic sexing, if we can make sex into a verb, right, without love, I'm going to take off the table. Right? But give me one second. One second. Well, go ahead. No, go, please. I just want you to define love. Okay, I'm going to get there. So I, I thought okay. you might ask that, and I was afraid of it. <laughs> right? I, only because I, want, I, want, I, want, I, want, I don't want to miss the first thing <laughs> that you said. Okay, go, so, go, go. So I'm going to talk about why I chose the word fuck. Because I think that's actually really important, and I don't want to gloss over that. Okay. We don't want to kind of gloss over fuck. And I, I chose the word intentionally. Right? I could have said making love. I could have talked about eros. I wrote a book about eros. I have another one coming out. I know the word. I've worked with it, I love the word. And we're gonna work with the word tomorrow. But there's a reason that the word fuck has power. And actually, we need to reclaim the power of fuck beyond genitals. There's a rawness to the term. There's an excitement to the term, right? right? When someone really wants to find the depth of their excitement, they don't say, honey, Give me eros. <laughs> Just doesn't do it. Fuck me, honey. It right? does much better. Why? But what we've done is we've actually somehow exiled the term to some degraded turf. We need to liberate fuck. And let's just look at the word just for a couple of minutes. You know, kind of what we might call the problem of fuck. Right? That word is confusing. I mean, is it a curse word? Fuck you. You're cursing someone. Are you saying... Have good sex? Fuck you. Have bad sex. You're a motherfucker. Your mother had sex? I want to have sex with your mother. Or you're saying, fucking A, which you're excited, right? <laughs> fucking A, I'm excited about sex? I'm excited that you're going to have sex? Or then sometimes it's a question. What the fuck? Right? <laughs> it's a question, right? You know? So it's a very confusing term, right? We're not exactly sure what to do with it. And the reason is because we've exiled fuck, right? We're afraid of the term. So we use it to curse. We use it in extreme anger. We use it in extreme excitement. We use it in wonderment as a question. 
But we need to reclaim fuck, right? And to actually elevate, right, fuck, right, to its core essence, which is, which is the explosion of reality that pulses in teams in every moment of existence, which is alive, right, pulsating, its pulsing source, right, that lives in every moment, right, that's available and accessible in every moment. And it's not just making love, right? It's fuck. Now, when you actually feel into that term, just feel into it, right? Do a little quantum physics, or go to the Mutazila in the 13th century in Spain, or go to the Kabbalists in the 16th century, or go to the Sufis, right, in Damascus, you'll see that every major system, both in the quantum world and the spiritual world, talks about the world, follow this for a second, coming anew into existence in every second. So the notion that the world is there is actually an illusion. When you actually find your way in, you actually realize the world is actually big banging, right? It's supernovaing, if you will, metaphorically, into existence, right? It's not destroying, it's creating in every second. And actually, there's no extra second in the world. And I want to get this idea, just share it with you, it's so gorgeous, right? There's no extra second. We think time is extra. So we live our lives in which we basically live every day, the same day we lived yesterday. So 365 days in a year, we keep repeating the same day. And many of us reach 75 or 80 or 85, we just keep, we kept repeating the same day, every day, and we never evolved. Because we never fucked the day open. Because right? actually every moment holds infinity, infinite creativity, infinite beauty, infinite explosive energy, infinite wisdom that's gorgeous and exploding. That's fuck. Right? Fuck is powerful. So when I say, Stuart, and that's why I choose the term, right, you can either fuck the moment open or let the moment fuck you open, what I'm doing is I'm respecting the gorgeous explosive infinity that lives in every dimension of reality. And the exile of the erotic takes place when both the term erotic and fuck are reduced to right, a particular form, which is genitals meeting, which is a gorgeous form, and what that relationship is to the rest of fuck we're going to spend the whole weekend on. That's a great question. Right? But let, 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 let's, cross that for, let's cross that bridge tomorrow. But we exile fuck into a very narrow place what we need to do is we need to expand fuck. Maybe here's the last way to say it and back at you. Remember Freud, our good friend that we've both studied, looked at, or you know, passed him <laughs> on the street? So Freud said everything that happens in the world, everything, without exception, it's all really sex. But Freud's move is, ready for this? It's a reductionist move. Freud says we're going to reduce everything. You thought it was this. You thought it was culture. It's not culture, buddy. It's sex. You thought mother was loving her child? No, no, no. That's not love. That's sex. Freud makes a reductionist move. We want to make an elevationist move. We want to realize that actually fuck actually models everything else. It's not that everything's reduced to sex. Sex actually is the model for what's actually happening in every second of reality. In every second of reality, either there's an explosion of fuck, which expresses itself in compassion, in love, in creativity, right, in, in, in just infinite bliss and gorgeousness, or the moment's closed. And that's why I choose fuck. So I just, I just offer that to you, and to either share talk or we just we move on to the next. Well, I wanted to hear you define love. Please, okay. Because um, I, hear, I hear this, and I don't disagree with anything that you say. Awesome. Um, uh, so, or maybe say it another way, I agree with everything that you say. Um, yes. But I think when you say that, um, that the body is, uh, how did you say it, is, is sex, something, something about the body having sex with love or something. How, sex how, is the body loving. Sex is the body loving. So I want you to define what you mean by loving. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Can I offer you a drink? Do you have water? I you got, do. You got water over there. My water is better than yours, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. <laughs> you know, but first, I just want to, I think that's such a great, I mean, let's, let's really have this inquiry together around love. Mm -hmm. I just want to say something about words for a second. Mm -hmm. And this is like a, a big, important thing. Just I, really, I want to I wanna put it in the room. It's a big deal. Well, I think so, too. And I think that people say, the reason I ask it, I mean, I have my own thing to say about it, but 
but I think it's a word that's bandied about. Absolutely. And it doesn't, it often, I think we need to be saying, knowing that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, so. so and I, my guess is that when you say it, everybody has a different picture. Yeah, so, so I'm completely with you. So I'll just do a little introduction, and then in order to kind of make love and to be giving and receiving, I'm gonna ask you actually, after my little intro, to actually share your, your notion of love, because I just talked for a while, so we'll kind of hear from you, and then I'll kind of share my notion of love if, that, if you're up for that. But before that, let me just say something about what we're doing here, right? what we're doing, what this context means. Because we've lost, we've lost this notion of a dialogue. And I'm actually so delighted to be here with Stuart. Stuart and I met, I don't know, eight, 10 months, a year ago, something like that, about a year back. At least, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. a little, a year and a half. We had, we had a lovely weekend together. You know, we, 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 we chatted on the phone a couple of times. I read Stuart's great little book, which is, you know, the best summary that I've seen, <laughs> right, of, uh, of, um, of Core Energetics. It's just a wonderful, wonderful book with that great blue cover, right? <laughs> and, um, and I'm just delighted in, in knowing Stuart, and I was just very excited to have this, this time to live beer in dialogue with you. And I just want to say something about dialogue for a second. So you all remember Plato? Remember Plato? Yeah. Right? Remember, you know, Comes in a little box. Comes in a little box, stuff. right? <laughs> right? And, and Plato had dialogues. Plato wrote dialogues. And one of my favorite pastimes is rereading Plato's dialogues, which are gorgeous. And his famous dialogue is called the Symposium. And the Symposium is when basically two people get together and they talk for the sake of clarifying the nature of reality. And as Plato says, that's an erotic act. See, fuck is happening right here. This is fuck. And there's actually no, right? Now, what we do is, right? What we do is, now, I, I knew, I knew, and I'm gonna keep a straight face here, right? I knew that as I said that, Stuart would either make a joke or move. It was unclear to me which move he would make, right? But I think he's kind of sexy, okay? But the answer is, is because we're so unused to talking about a dialogue as fuck, you see? In other words, the reason we laugh about it is, is because it's actually hard to hold, because it's orgasm, it's extreme light. But actually, imagine what it would mean if conversation was fuck. Right? What do we do in conversation? When we do in conversation, since it's hard for us to get erotic, meaning to enter eros, and to enter eros is to enter the inside of the circle. So when people come together in conversation, you know what people do almost always? Right? Since they can't enter the inside, they talk about a third person, usually derisively, in order to take that person and take them outside the circle to give themselves the illusion that they're inside the circle. That's pseudo fuck or pseudo eros. But actually, Plato's dialogue, the symposium, the entire dialogue is about fuck. The entire thing, that's where he defines eros. That's what the whole thing's about. So to actually have the joy of a conversation in which we want to define and really get to understand the nature of reality in a non-dogmatic way, not, a non not, not in the old way, like the church said, we're going to tell you what it is. We actually check together. And we actually find the inside of reality. And we begin to reconstruct a vision of the patterns that connect. Because that's what we're missing, my friends. Let's just really understand this. We're living in a world where the greatest yearning is a vision of the patterns that connect. We've lost that vision. right? And a kind of world in which fundamentalism gives us a clear vision. The liberal world is so lost so unable to articulate a core vision of a shared spiritual language, right, that actually the very foundation, the very axis mundi, right, the very core structures of society are being deconstructed because the liberal world is unable to construct a cogent vision, right, which is a big, large world. Now, one last sentence. So people will say, no, no, I don't want words. I want to have an experience. So I say to that, fuck that, okay? <laughs> and let me tell you what I mean by that. Okay. What I mean is, of course we're going to have an experience. We're going to spend the next two days deep in embodied experience. And Stuart's a master at creating experience. And all experience, without exception, is interpreted. There is no experience you can have that's not interpreted. And the greatest mistake of the human potential movement was to say we're going to throw away frameworks of meaning. We're going to have an experience because there is no experience you can ever have that's not interpreted. You have an enlightenment experience? It's a real experience, total enlightenment experience. Great, but if your framework of meaning is ethnocentric, meaning my people, ethnocentric, 
You'll go and blow up a few blocks from here, the World Trade Center, to cut off the phallus of America because your Enlightenment experience is interpreted through an ethnocentric prism, and you're going to go kill people. You can be a shaman, having the most beautiful Aztec shamanic experience, New Age bliss, and the Mayans are living awake in you. And that is a good Mayan. You sacrifice 10,000 women a year and have their hearts ripped out because your shamanic experience was interpreted through an ethnocentric prism in which the feminine was ultimately devalued as a core construct. So the notion that we're going to actually create a vision of the world based solely on experience is simply wrong. Now, we can't just live in words. We can't just live in constructs. We need experiences. So experiences inform words and frameworks of meaning inform experiences and that's what, that's what we're here to do. But as we this evening kick off the Integral Evolutionary Tantra School with a conversation about meaning, that is erotic. That is an experience. We're creating a framework and frameworks ultimately matter. And here's the last sentence and we're gonna hear from Stuart about love, I think, right? And here's the, frame, here's the sentence, okay? The human being lives, and human being means you and me, all of us in an inescapable set of frameworks. There is not one person in this room that doesn't live in frameworks, like, like red tinted glasses. You think you're looking at the world, you're looking through your glasses. Enlightenment is to deconstruct the frameworks. What are you looking through? And we've gotta be able to do that. And having a conversation about what we mean by love is such a great way right, to do that. When we say love, Stuart says, what do we mean? So, sir. First take, what do we mean by love? Okay, what do we mean by love? I love this. Uh, yeah. Everyone choose a partner. You don't have to move just someone close to you in a way that you could look at them. Has everybody got somebody that they could look at? If you don't have somebody, raise your hand so they can find you. If you got, if you, she has her hand up, somebody find. It's okay? Yeah. Totally good. Yeah. It's great to be with you. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's, a, I think it's, we're such a great balance. Actually. We're awesome. Awesome. So, okay, you got somebody? So. Okay, everybody's got somebody. All right. So look at that person. The first thing that I want to say about that is most of the time, in my experience, when you look at somebody or you're with them, you don't see them. And the first thing I would ask you is see this person. Don't make an interpretation of what you see. I see sadness in your eyes or I see how nice your breasts look, or um, say what you exactly see to yourself. Let yourself see this person. And then, after you've done that, ask yourself how it makes you feel. When I see you, it makes me feel My guess is, if you really saw the person, it opened your heart, and that's love. Mm. Beautiful. So, this doesn't need to go on like for any length of time. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're creating relationships here, but find a way just to say thank you to this person before you end. So love is, is a heart connection. It's a, willingness to, it's, it's a willingness to see the other with your heart. And most of the time, we, we don't do that. We see the other as somebody that needs to be a vehicle to receive things that we want to talk about. 
Mm-hmm. Mm. And I think we, we, the whole defense system of the body, the whole purpose of it is to prevent us from reaching our heart. <coughs> it's like the most dangerous place on the human plane for us is to be in our heart. And being in the heart doesn't necessarily mean that you're, that you're soft. You can be in your heart and be angry. It means being in your truth that's coming from the center of you in that moment. And if you're in your heart and you're angry, for instance, and you let yourself have it, it'll go away very fast. It's when you don't have permission for it that, it's, that the, the negative, frustrating places stay forever. Um, well, that's a, that's a lot of words for me to say already, so I'll, I'll let you tell me how smart I was with that. <laughs> 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 you kiss nice. <laughs> it's okay, I give it back to you. Awesome. So what is love? I asked you first. <laughs> love, as Stuart so beautifully in act in the room, is when hearts talk to each other. That is so deeply, wildly, profoundly, self-evidently, obviously true. And to actually feel the presence of love in the room opens us. And it's the beautiful Totally good. The kiss really warmed me up. Yeah. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> That's good, thanks. And for the few of you, some of you I've met before, most of you I haven't. But that kind of heart to heart connection and reality <laughs> is for me the most important thing in my life. And it's the way I live in the world. And it's, it's why I'm happy to be here with Stuart. Because when we met each other, we recognized that in each other with utter delight. And it's the beginning of the story, which is why it's so awesome that we began with it. It can't be the end of the story. It's, we can't build a world based on love being a feeling of heart-to-heart connection. Which is why Stuart said, look at each other. You have to see each other. And so let me now try and open it up with four or five very simple steps. Step one, love at its core cannot be exiled to the limited place between human beings. You with me? Human love is a gorgeous, stunning expression of something much larger. So let's go all the way back together for a second to the great flaring forth that somehow in the 1950s got called the Big Bang. In this great flaring forth, what happened? And then we're going to come directly to human love, and we're going to come to sex, and we're going to come to the whole thing. But I want to start with you, right, framework. Let's go deep. In the great flaring forth, the Big Bang, 
quarks. Remember quarks? Quarks are kind of hanging out in the world. And then these quarks make a decision. Remember what happened, everyone? These quarks decide, let's come together, and let's fuck. And a single boundary form, forms around them, and an atom is formed. And there's this force in the world of mutuality, recognition, union, embrace. And then these atoms, all hanging out independently, doing their thing, kind of feel this internal movement in them, and they want to do an exercise, and they say, let's sit together and look at each other. And they look at each other and they say, let's fuck. <laughs> and the atoms come together, a single boundary forms around them, and a molecule is formed. And then, you know exactly what happened, it happened again. <laughs> These molecules are hanging out, right sister in the back? Molecules are just hanging out, they're doing their thing, just like all of us living in, you know, Lincoln Towers, everybody in their own apartment, <laughs> you, know, you know, just in New York, kind of busily walking down the street as if I've got someplace to go, a million things to do on Saturday, and I'm not lonely, not me. And then these molecules get together and they do this exercise. And they look at each other and they feel something open, which Alfred North White had called prehension. They feel a prehension. They feel themselves open and they say, let's fuck. And the molecules come together and they form a complex molecule. And then they're, they're, they're having such a good time over a couple of billion years kind of complexing together that they wake up. And this thing called a cell emerges, and then the cell right, moves from a single-celled unit without a nucleus right, to a, a multi-celled unit with a nucleus, and then the whole story keeps moving. And all of evolution is motivated, animated by fuck, by eros, by evolutionary love. Right? Love actually drives the entire prophecy. Well, I mean, Dante called it the love that moves the sun and the stars. And what we've done is we've said love's between us. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That's so unexciting. <laughs> it's so non-erotic. And it's so small. Right? Let's widen it. Right? Love is the force, the eros, that initiated all that is, that animates all that is. It's the movement of mutuality, recognition, union, and embrace that causes all connectivity in your body right now, every single person in this room. What's your name? Ruth. Ruth. In Ruth's body right now, she's right here. What's your name? Mary. Mary? Okay, Ann? Michael. Michael. So Ruth, Mary, and Michael. Ann Russell. Russell, Ruth, Mary, and Michael. Between right, the four of them, because I don't want to single any person out, right, between the four of them, there are 300 trillion cells dancing. 300 trillion cells dancing. In each one of those gorgeous units, of God, right? There's about 75 trillion cells. And if you follow a little molecular biology, they're all utterly unique. So if you would compare Ruth's cells, right, to Michael's cells, right, completely different. Different world, different reality. Thank God for right? that. Thank God for that. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately unique. An utterly unique cellular signature of infinite complexity in which they're all fucking. They're dancing with each other in these intimate dances of connectivity, which are all generative, creative, life-giving, sustaining. And if you would enter into right, Russell at this moment and put it up on a screen, you would see a level of dazzling complexity, gorgeousness, that to even call it gorgeous, ridicules what's happening in his body in this very moment, right now, right here, happening in every single person in this room before any connection was made to any other person. So when we then move right, to do Stuart's exercises and we look at each other, that is right, the love that's inherent in all that is, that moves every moment, then expressing itself and bursting out in this inner subjective space between us. Now that's wild. Because when you really get that, that means that you can access in your love not just what's happening between two separate contracted selves with complex neurotic psychopathological histories who are trying to somehow cover over the emptiness of it kind of not having worked out precisely well in this world and not having gotten fucked recently, right? <laughs> you can actually open yourself up and say, wow, love is coursing through me, right? I am an expression of outrageous love and love lives outrageously in me. And that actually when I become a lover, and right? I'm aligning with all that is. <coughs> right? I'm actually expressing the true nature of reality. And so what is love? 
So here we go. A, A, love is opening and not closing. That's what it is. I'm making a decision to open and not to close. That's a whole world. Two, love is not an emotion at its core. Love at its core, as Stuart said to us implicitly, he said, look at each other. Love is a perception. If love's just an emotion, Cupid's arrow hit you, oops, hit somebody else. Emotion wore off. Energy in motion, it motioned someplace else. No, love at its core is a decision. It's a capacity. It's a perception. To love you means I see you with God's eyes. To be a lover is to see with God's eyes. Right? And the God you don't believe in doesn't exist. So if the word trips you up, replace it with something else. But it's to see with the eyes of eternity. So therefore, love is infinite. It doesn't, it doesn't wear out. Your perception gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And finally, love is radical gifting. If I love you, I want to give you everything. Right? I want to give you everything there could possibly be to give. And all of that creates the experience, the emotion we call love. So love is opening, not closing. Right? Love is radical gifting. Right? Love is to see with God's eyes, radical perception. And those three qualities of love are happening in every moment of reality from the great flame forth to today in every one of us here, which is why love is the most powerful reality that could possibly be. That's why we're going to spend a weekend right, talking about outrageous love because, last sentence, the only response to a world of outrageous pain, and we live in a world of outrageous pain. We live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. We live in a world of outrageous beauty. The only response to outrageous beauty right, is outrageous love. So to walk the path of the outrageous lover, it's the only choice we have. And how to do that, what that's about, is what Stuart's life work is about. It's what the School of Integral Evolutionary Tantra is about. And back to you, sir. And it's about what your work is about. Let's it's about, be clear. It's, it's about what my work's about. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, It's very, it's very interesting for me to hear you speak. <laughs> uh, you have you have such a such a, a remarkable use of words. You know. um, I say he has such a remarkable use of words. That's you know that, um, and it's so different than the words that I use. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we say the same thing, from a f with very different words. Um, Isn't that awesome? It's nice. Yeah. It's, it's nice. It sort of takes me a while to realize, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, no, all of this stuff, what, you know, what does it mean? <laughs> but um, if I were synthesizing it to my words, it would be um, uh, the part that I feel the most strongly connected with is, a, is his generosity. It's a desire to give you everything I have. Um, because relationships get destroyed in the place where we take from the other. Mm. And most, most relationships, even the ones that are good, that we've, where we love each other, we take. I, I, we, don't give, we don't give it freely, we want something back. And the reality of what Mark is saying is when you give it freely, you get back so much more than you ever could have dreamed. You know, so much more than you ever could. And that's the, the difference. There's no difference between the, the giving and the receiving. Yes, if you're truly giving. And most of the time, we're not truly giving. Um, so the other part was the part I tried to demonstrate in, the, in that little experience, where the true, genuine desire to see the other if you think about that, if you want to give the magic formula for intimacy, it starts with the true, genuine desire to see the other. And the, and the other half of the coin for the rest of it to, be, to have intimacy is the true, general, genuine desire to be seen. I see you and I show you me. And you have bliss. And most of the time, you don't do both. And um, when I want you to know me, because I think the, the secret of, of, for me, the secret of, of love 
of having a relationship with love is the secret of wanting to be known. For wanting you to want me and love me and care about me for who I am, not who I want you to think I am. And I have put a lot of places in the place that wants you to want me for who I want you to think I am. I mean, uh, I give you a quick synopsis of my personal, we do personal struggles here? Sure. It's part of a dialogue? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, of where I've been recently, uh, I, my struggle has been, um, you'll laugh at this, Mary, my struggle has been, um, I, I want you to want me because I'm hot. <laughs> And most of the time, the people that want me, want me because I'm wise, or I'm, I'm old, and I'm, I'm generous, and I'm spiritual. But I want you to want me because I'm hot. <laughs> so I'm out of reality. I mean, you know, uh, I'm 75 years old. It'll, you know, you might want Mark because he's hot, but, you're, you know, but, it, but to come into reality, into the... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> to come into the truth of, um, of who I am and see myself and what, what, like you might come to want me after you get to know me in a certain way because of the qualities that I have. But you see me next to other, to, to other people who have, who, are, who have different bodies and different energy than I, you're not going to choose me. And I put on you, choose me or I leave. I mean, I've done that for many years. I've done that, and I've lost some very some people who could have been good friends, and um, it's taken me a long time to learn that. I put it out to you as a as a present to not lose people, because because anybody that you could have love with, the sex part, it 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 can't be the goal. The physical sexual part needs to come out of it or not come out of it. It's not, if you get the, the touching and the holding and the loving and the connection and the desire to, to see and feel each other, um, the other parts are much, much less valuable, much smaller. And in, in my life, unfortunately, I, I made them bigger than they should have been. Yeah. I don't anymore, actually. I'm, I'm having much more love and I'm also having much more sex. <laughs> <laughs> But don't spread that around. <laughs> it's nice when a guy is talking on camera to a full room and says, don't spread it around. <laughs> I'm just saying. I forgot know. about that. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. There's a confidentiality here. This can only go on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let, let's, let's talk for a second. I mean, it's so beautiful, Stuart. Let's, let's talk for a second about a really hard topic that we never actually deal with head on in any way. Didn't, didn't I just? <laughs> right, right, which you really did. I mean, you really did. I mean, let's really talk about what Stuart brought up, which is hotness. You know, I mean, let's just really talk about that. You know, the desire to be hot. And the reason we have a desire to be hot isn't actually, and this is really what Stuart's saying, it's, it's not actually that, because of course, hot is different in every generation. So there's actually no platonic archetype called hot, right? You know, in one society, large breast is problematic, right? In the mid 18th century, and if you're stuck with large breasts, what can you do? You work what you can to, you know, maybe raise enough money to have a reduction, right? In another society, right, a beautiful belly, right, is absolutely, you know, Botticelli is central, right, to being hot, right? So when we say we want to be hot, what we mean is we want to be chosen. Desired. We want to be desired, right? We want to be chosen, desired. We want to be attractive. We want someone <laughs> to be with us, right? Henry Kissinger was considered really hot. Really? Right? <laughs> by lots of women, right? Because, because, right, men are hot for lots of different reasons, right? It's very rare that you see, you know, a large, you know, group of men gathered around, right, a, well, let me do the reverse, right, the reverse, right, the reverse would be like this. In, in a very broad, terrible, overgeneralized, 
inappropriate, politically incorrect way of saying it, right? <laughs> Go like for you it. would say, <laughs> right, that there's a general masculine tendency to objectify the body, and there's a feminine tendency to objectify the body of the car, right? <laughs> that is to say, right, there's a feminine tendency to objectify male power, right? And there's a masculine tendency to, to objectify feminine beauty. There's a thousand exceptions. However, right, the fact that you even know what I'm talking about, right, means there's, there's some truth in it. Now, so hot means a lot of different things, right? But what hot's really about is I want to be chosen. So I want to just throw an image out at you, which is actually, if I have to like sum up for you in just really a self-revelatory kind of way, because following Stuart's you know, beautiful opening, what would I like to accomplish in my own life, right, which I've worked on for about a decade in my own practice, and what would I like to kind of impart to my circle of students and to, you know, to the world right, in the best way that I can, would be to shift patterns of arousal. Because if we could actually shift patterns of arousal, the world would change on its axis. So for the men, for the men in the room or for the masculine that lives in the women in the room, whichever one, what would it mean if you could be aroused by love? Now track that for a second. What would it mean to be aroused by love? That's hot. That's really hot. Now, let me just go for a show of hands of the men in the room. How many people have once or twice had that experience, being aroused by love? Okay, a couple of people. All right, it's not the usual, not every day, everyone agrees, but you've had it a couple of times. Just feel how hot that is. What would it be if you could conjure up the image of your beloved and you could actually be aroused by love? It'd be a shocking world. The entire world would change. Right? Everything would change. Politics would change, economics would change, the entire structure of society would shift if we could actually arouse right, by love. And what that means is, now here's the next sentence, that we take responsibility for our own arousal. That's a huge sentence. So what we usually do is we demand that our partner arouse us. And the feminine, seduced by that structure of society, right, is preyed on by a multi-billion dollar cosmetic industry, right? And I was talking to one of the people who has a $250 million budget, one of the largest cosmetic companies in the world, you know, not long ago. We were sitting over lunch. We were in Oxford in England. And he said to me, the way I run my ads is that a woman feels, and he was proud of this, right? That she won't get the man if she doesn't buy my product, right? And I literally want to kill the man, right? <laughs> and he was talking about this proudly. And here we, here we have the face of shadow revealed completely unconscious, right? So we kind of build this structure. If I'm not hot, that's what Stuart spoke so clearly. If I'm not hot, right, I, I'm not gonna be recognized, right? And hot has this very particular structure in our society, which most of us can't meet our whole lives. There's no one who can their entire life meet that. I was talking to a very, very close friend of mine, Sally Kempton, who's a Swami Durgananda, one of the, she writes in Yoga Journal every month, and she's like the, major teacher of yoga, right, in the country today, kind of the philosophy of yoga, one of my closest friends, a, a deep Dharma sister. And Sally's 70. And Sally was hot for most of her life. She's just a kind of hot woman. You know, she's 22, writing for the New York Times, Village Voice. Her dad was Murray Kempton, was kind of a big writer dude. And she kind of was hot. And she said, as she hit, like, you know, 61, 62, 60, and she's still completely beautiful, but she's not quite hot in that way she noticed herself becoming invisible. And she said the experience of a woman becoming invisible that no one's willing to talk about. And the only way to respond to that is to shift our own patterns of arousal. So I would say the goal of Tantra right, is to actually be aroused in fuck by love. Right, to close that gap. And to mind and close that gap literally changes the source code of reality. Everything changes. It's the ninja move in culture. <laughs> it's a the ninja move. But it's the most single most influential move we can make in culture. And I believe that we can train ourselves. And here's just the last sentence in confessional. I've been trying to train myself in that last decade. All right? I have really good weeks. <laughs> and then sometimes you kind of fall back. You just you can't find it. And you work on it again. It's a training. Like everything is. Right? Everything great. <laughs> 
requires training. It's not automatic. So the evolution of fuck, right, is when fuck and love meet in that gorgeous, gorgeous way that Stuart put on the table. God, I'm good. <laughs> Stuart is awesome. Awesome. Maybe this is the way you the way you say what I said it sounds so much better than what I thought I said. <laughs> It sounds, it sounds, it sounds different, but they merge. Don't they merge? Don't they merge together perfectly, everybody? Let's give a big hand for everybody. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Maybe this is a perfect time, kind of holding our time frames, to open up for questions, and we would just ask if, just kind of, as you ask your question, try and hold the question to be not something which is limited only to you. And it's not a particular counseling question, but a kind of a question that's kind of holds in the room that we can all kind of play in. Is that, is that fair? Yeah? Okay, awesome. Remember, a question, not a speech. Okay? Yeah. Awesome. So no, she, we got she, she got ah, the yana. So the conversation about the man and the masculine, I'm wondering if you have a ninja move with the feminine. I'm thinking you might. So that's my question. Yeah. I think I think the ninja move I think the ninja move for the feminine and Viana is as always perceptive and notice that I left it out because it's a it's a more complex thing to put into the room but uh, the woman demands and the man responds in this moment um, one of the things that were, were, were very easy for us to say that men objectify women and men do objectify women and that's not all in all a bad thing Right? I had a, a wonderful lover who used to say when making love, she'd say, objectify me. <laughs> you know, me meaning objectification is problematic if that's the entire relationship. But I want you to think my shoulder's beautiful. Right? So objectification is problematic when it's the whole story. Right? But what we forget is that women objectify men just as much. And that's really, really important to realize. Right? Men feel Maybe turn off, turn off, yeah. That's okay. Apologize for that. Christina's going for the, for the long-term deal. Yeah, the, the noise comes out in the... Yeah, so we're sorry about that. So, so women objectify men, right, just as much, and it's actually everyone refuses to see it. So how many women will go out with the guy who decided, instead of becoming an investment banker, he was going to become an art historian? How sexy is the guy, there's one, okay, okay, right? How sexy is the guy who decided to become a kindergarten teacher, right, who's making $35,000 a year, right? Yeah. Now, again, in this room, there might be some awesome exceptions, but generally, kindergarten, kindergarten teacher does not do better than investment banker. Kindergarten teacher, right, is literally holding the lives, right, of 30 young, gorgeous, beautiful, stunning beings, an investment banker is often involved in green mail, right, moving right, chips around a table, creating no value for society. Right? And right, the investment banker is, by and large, for the overwhelming majority of the feminine, far more attractive than the kindergarten teacher. And that is, let's say it clearly, feminine shadow. Because what we do is we make this huge mistake. We say the masculine, we identify the masculine with egocentric, predator, right, abusive shadow. And the feminine is beautiful. That's nonsense. The masculine and feminine are both beautiful. They're both origins of development. They're starting points of development. And there's masculine gorgeous beauty. And there's feminine gorgeous beauty. And there's masculine shadow. And there's feminine shadow. And so we need to really be able to call out feminine shadow. And so in that way, I would say the evolution of the feminine is that the woman is willing to marry the guy who's not bringing in the big bucks. Right, because he's dedicated his life to something which is infinitely valuable. Right? And the gentleman who's not right, actually bringing in right, the, the gecko Wall Street right, investment banker money shouldn't feel, here's the word, impotent. And the amount of men who choose their profession and violate their inner nature because that's the only way they're going to get the woman and society has taught them, enter the death professions Give up what you think is valuable because you need to get a job lawn mowing instead of studying art because you're not going to get a date any other way, right? That's an early kind of brainwashing of society. 
which has actually emasculated the true power of the masculine. And so we need to be able to reclaim that right, in a very powerful way. So thank you, Liana. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, awesome. Who else do we got here? Take it away. Um, Rachel, why don't you stand up so we can see you? Didn't know there was anybody even down there. <laughs> Well, maybe we'll, we'll both talk about it. Let me just introduce Rachel Alba. Rachel is a, a member of our think tank, a young scholar. Um, she's working on really reclaiming sexuality within the context of the Catholic Church. That's where she's doing her graduate work, working on a, a think tank project with us and really deep in this conversation. So, and, and I don't understand her question. I mean. And, and there's what, what happens? <laughs> tell me if I, I'll, I'll reframe it and tell me if I get it right. Okay. So Rachel's saying this idea that we put too much on sex and we ask it to do too much for us, can we expand on that a little bit? Is that okay? Um, Close? It was that, yeah. You used the word eros, so I'm gonna like. I'll get back to the word eros. I, <laughs> want, I wanted to kind of open it up generally, so yeah. I don't want to. And want, that like, it breaks down when you put too much on it. Got you. We put too much, say it one more time. I mean, I'm maybe slow. No, you're perfect. <laughs> Give, shoot. So we put too much emphasis Well, I, what breaks down? The sex. It doesn't work. I, 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 don't, I think the sex could work if you put too much, it's, but, it, but it's not the goal. It's the wrong... It, so it works. So you have an organ, so it was nice. So what? You know, I mean, you know... I mean, f I don't mean so what that it's not a good thing to do. I mean, it's fine to do it, but it's not, it can't be the goal. It's crazy for it to be the goal. It doesn't, it doesn't give you anything. I, you know, I can do it by myself. I don't need anyone to do that. <laughs> so, so here, this this will be this will be our first point of disagreement, which is exciting, which is great. Okay. So here I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of gently and lovingly disagree. And one of the things that we get to do. Well, in the I'm gonna disagree back, not so gently and lovingly. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> awesome, that's fantastic. So, w what Rachel's asking in her question is, what do, what do I mean when I say that actually sex does break down? I think sex does break down, right? That is to say, when we ask the sexual. And it could be that after I, as I, as I kind of unpack it, we might come to complete agreement on it or not, which are both great. But actually, let me give you a sentence. The sexual models the erotic. It doesn't exhaust the erotic. And by the erotic, I mean fullness of presence. And we're going to talk about the, spend the entire weekend on this. Fullness of presence, being on the inside, yearning, wholeness, fantasy, imagination, giving and receiving, radical gifting, right? Everything, life, right? So the sexual models eros, but it doesn't exhaust eros. We want to live erotically or live and fuck in every dimension of our lives. When the only place we fuck is when we're fucking, then fucking breaks down and stops <coughs> working. What do you mean well, stops working? I'll tell you exactly what I mean by stops working. It stops being exciting. It stops being compelling. It stops being alive. And it stops being satisfying, which is why I'll just throw at you a couple of statistics, right? 73% of married couples in America have sex once a month or less. That's shocking. Why? Because the place they're looking for fuck, right, is in sex, right? And most of America is living non-erotically, non-fuck in the rest of their lives. So actually, fuck works. It's alive when you're living in eros in all of your life. And then you express it, it explodes and fuck, right? But when you actually exile eros, or exile fuck, and for now I'm using them synonymously, when you exile the erotic into the sexual, the sexual breaks down under the burden of a weight that it can't bear. And the opposite is true as well. But when you actually right, right, engage fuck eros with the person that you're erotically co-creating in the world with, and it completely changes the nature of fuck, and actually explodes it. So, so I think that's a, a critical idea and actually, actually speaks to the great sexual malaise in America today. In other words, we had a sexual revolution. David Reisman, remember, wrote you know, 30 years ago, sex is the, the final frontier. Well, we've crossed it and found it wanting. And we found it wanting because we've exiled eros right, into sex and to fuck. 
And when in, what has to happen is, is that the erotic needs to be happening in every dimension of our life. When it doesn't, actually good sex ultimately collapses. You can't sustain good sex, let me be clear, with one person. What you can do is, you can jump around to different people, and even then, the sex breaks down. And even then, after a certain amount of time, it breaks down. It becomes singularly uninteresting and uncompelling. Right? So for sex to be alive, right, genuinely, in a sustainable way, I want to add that. In other words, it can always be a great two hours, but for sustainably great sex, right, you need sex to be eroticized. Right? You can't exile eros into sex. So that would be, that would be I, and I think that's core. I'm kind of energetic. <laughs> we could write a book about that. Let's do it. <laughs> so, um, I agree. I don't, I mean, you know, I don't know what I disagree to anymore. <laughs> uh, or what, what our difference is. I don't have any difference with what you just said. So we're together on it. Okay. Rachel, does that, does that, does that address your question? Awesome. Awesome. Who, who was the go? Take it away, sir. What's your name? I'm David. We met as we walked in, right? Yes, we did. How you doing? I'm doing good. I was putting my shirt on back there when we met. You were doing that as well. I was, right. Yes. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't buy into the um, theory that uh, uh, sex with the same person for an extended period of time, or for as long as it may be breaks down at all. Love, love is, is, is that bond, that, that connection is... That's exactly, we're saying the same thing. Yeah, he's, uh, no, no, we're he's saying, saying that if you have the sex without love, it breaks down. Sex without eros, meaning without shared creativity, shared recognition, that's, love breaks down. We're, that was we're why this, I was with you for a while, and that's I, why I changed we're on the, we're to agree. We're on the same page. I agree, but it, 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 you made it out, it sounded to me as though you needed to jump from bed to bed to bed to bed. No, no, no. No, no, no. That, no, no. that was why I was on the other side, but now no, I, that, everyone that's got, not everyone what he was the, saying. Everyone else clear? Yeah. Show of hands? We're good. Clear. Okay, good. Thank you, but thank you. Thank you. Right, because if you were a voice in the room, there's probably one other person, you clarified it for them. Thank you. No, got it. We're good. Thanks. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. I like the glasses. Awesome. Finding a good pair of glasses is hard, isn't it? What's that? Finding a good pair of glasses is hard. Really. Easy for you? <laughs> Did you ever think of doing that operation that no. people do? Really? <laughs> why? You're just not, in, not into it? Surgery? Surgery on your Did eyes, why? Surgery? God, why would you do that, right? I, I know, I always <laughs> lose my glasses, though. Yeah, you don't? Okay, we'll talk about it. Anyways, okay. We're just chatting here. Okay, so we're, give, give us another question in the room. We've answered all the questions. Question, any, question? any question that's, yeah, any question you like that's generally related to the topic. We probably won't answer it if it's just any question. <laughs> well, I would just say as follows, right? What's your name? My name is Anna. Anna, how's life going? Good? Kinda. Kinda? Okay. Here's what I can promise you. The kinda is going to go up six points dramatically if you come. That's all I got to say. Kinda is going to be rocking. <laughs> would love to see you. Awesome. There are, by the way, in terms of the workshop, the workshop actually is sold out. There's pretty much as many people as we can hold. We, we actually figured out a way to reconfigure the room to actually have five or six more people come. So if you're interested in coming, you actually have to tell us you can't show up because we're, we're working the room and the exercises very carefully based on who's in the room. So Christina's over here, right? And Cynthia, where's Cynthia? Okay. Cynthia over there. So make sure to talk to Christina or Cynthia, right, if you'd like to come tomorrow, okay? Okay, let's take, let's take, I'd say, three more questions than anything related to sex, love, and eros, and we'll take it away. What's your name, ma'am? Christina. <coughs> Christina. Uh -huh. Okay. I have a question for Stuart. Awesome. Um, when you were talking about uh, the difficulty in letting go of the desire to, for others to choose you or to find you desirable, um, I could identify a lot with that. And, uh, and so my question is very hard to put into words to take responsibility for those pieces of me that that interfere in the connection, which is the, the, 
needed to be chosen, needed to be wanted. I find it really hard to take responsibility for those without dishonoring myself. So I wonder, have you, in the process, beautiful. in the process of working with those pieces, how can you make room for honoring Thanks. that part of you that's Thanks. Your question actually takes me to a, to a very vulnerable place in me. And um, for me, when I was in this place, and I have to say that I'm not in that place now, and, and, and I could maybe have a talk about how I got out of it, but if I'm in a place that wants the woman to desire me, what happened to me is I would give her all my power. I'll do anything want me, I'll become a slave, I'll become a nothing, I'll do anything you want so you want me. And, I, and the more that I, that, that I did that, the less she wants me. And I become a piece of shit in my, in my own sense of self and in hers. And the way out for me was to feel that the reality of who I am and the man who I am is desirable not for the qualities that I wanted to necessarily have them desire me for, but the man I am is a desirable man. And if someone doesn't want it, there'll be someone who does. You know. And in that place, I don't need something from the woman. I can be steward with her and let her go. I don't have to have her, if I have to have her produce something for me, I lose me. So it's, it's a great question that you ask me and a very important part of my journey. And thank you for asking it. Thanks, Christina. Whatever comes up in the room. Yeah, name. So, I've been diving give, into give, give us your name. Cassandra, Cassandra. Cassandra. Welcome. Thank you. And um, I've been diving deeply into sexuality for the past year. If you don't want to do it, you do it if well, it's pleasurable. You're not going to do, you're not going to make do any act or anything, any touching, unless it's pleasurable to a person who's touching. Right. And so I think that for the other person's pleasure. So I guess I wanted your view on it. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted his view. Oh. I disagree. Right? And I hear it. I love it like deep honor, but in lovemaking, sometimes you can bracket your own pleasure for the sake of waiting on the desire or serving someone else's pleasure, right? So let me just kind of be very specific. So I was talking to someone six weeks ago wonderful woman who was married for 10 years and she said her husband you know always refused to have oral sex with her because he just didn't like it right and so I spoke to him and I said hey what's the deal man what? you know what's the deal he said I just I don't really enjoy it so I looked at him I said so what get into it right now if it was this kind of horrific, repulsive, right, in other words, but it wasn't, he just, he just wasn't into it. And I said to him, well, if you love her, you're actually going to experience enormous pleasure in pleasuring her. And that's the place where the secret of the kiss begins to play. Like that, okay? Yeah. Oh. Total. Yeah. Thanks, Cassandra. Anyone else in the room? Back there. Give us your name. Mary Beth. Hey, Mary Beth. I believe you said <clears throat> something about taking responsibility for our own arousal. Yeah. And that really resonated with me, so I just would like wonder if you could expand on that. Yeah, and, and maybe we, we can both talk about it if, if, it, if it speaks to you, Stuart. The, the question is the, the sentence that we talked about earlier 
that we usually rely on another person to arouse us. But actually, the shift would be if we take responsibility for our own arousal. And you're picking up on a really key sentence. It's, it's actually one of the most important things for me that I'm thinking about and that I'm sharing with, 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 you know, with our kind of circles these days. And I really appreciate you, you know, kind of picking it up and, and catching it. So thank you so much. Any, any thoughts on it, Stuart? No. Take <laughs> Yeah, no, total, total fair. Um, let, let me give you an example. So I'm going to try and address it really briefly, both from the perspective of monogamy and kind of being post-conventional. You know, it's called polyamory. I kind of like the word post-conventional, meaning a non-classical monogamous relationship. So let's just talk about monogamy for a second and, and just Without getting into this topic, if anyone wants to know my core belief on it, I think both are legitimate options. I think celibacy is a great option. Monogamy is a great option. Post-conventionality is a great, great option. Each one of them can be holy in their own particular place and time. Different conversation. I just thought of um, 30 years of my teachers that will turn over in their grave right when they, when they see this clip. They just <laughs> floated through my head. So I got paused by a second. So let's, let's, take, let's take monogamy for a second, okay? Mary Beth. I got the name right? Mary Beth? Okay. So how can you possibly get excited by the same person in the same bed year after year? Now remember, there's only a question I'm asking. I'm not saying this is impossible. So I'm just I'm framing the question. It's actually not easy. And that actually is, remember, I, mean, I just want to say it clearly, that is a challenge. That's not a given. It's not automatic. And the answer is that you take responsibility for your own arousal. Now, what does that mean? So, for example, I was talking recently to a close friend of mine, Annie, and Annie Lala, who's actually a, a good friend, and we're actually going to be giving a course together in like six weeks from now uh, called Sex Without Shame. And she said to me, wow. The way I take responsibility for my own arousal is I masturbate thinking about some great thing that Eben said in his talk the day before. And I said, Annie, that rocks. And what did she mean? She meant that in order to be monogamous with the person, you have to eroticize all of them, right? You can't just eroticize, you know, washboard abs, you know, particular set of shoulders, right? You gotta eroticize everything about them and let yourself Right, right, involve yourself, arouse yourself to every dimension. So they said something kind of really insightful, that's totally hot. But they were compassionate, right, right, in a particular moment you saw, man, that's totally arousing. What you have to do is break this narrow definition of arousal, which says I'm only aroused by these three things, because society told me I'm only aroused by these three things, and my patterns of arousal were determined by society. Liberation is to liberate my patterns of arousal and slam the door, right, in society's, <laughs> right, very, very narrow and constricted, right, vision of patterns of arousal, okay? And that's a powerful thing to do. And here's the good news, Mary Beth, it's doable. You can totally do it, and the way to do it is you practice. You just practice. So that's the way it would work kind of in classical monogamy, right? And then if you would move to kind of a post-conventional world where you might have more than one lover, so there again, though, you've got to do the same thing. You can't rely, let's say from a male perspective, on a new pair of breasts to arouse you, right? Because it doesn't last, right? It's, especially if you've got more than one lover, it just doesn't hold. So the way that you can really hold arousal is you actually enter into and commit to some deep knowing of the other person. And you open yourself up to the fullness of who that person is. And when you do that, then their body literally transforms in front of you. Literally, it becomes luminous, radiant. And then you're able to actually find arousal, right, from arenas that you never thought possible. But the key pivoting point, like the big ninja move, is that you shift your own internal vision from they're responsible for my arousal, in which case you're actually not being loving to them. It's actually completely oppressive to make your partner solely responsible for your arousal. Now, that doesn't mean that your partner 
shouldn't play every possible delightful appropriate game that's within the context of their own integrity to be arousing. Of course they should. With, again, within the context of their integrity. And everyone knows what that is. Right? That I want to be arousing for my partner is awesome. I mean, just to give you a simple example, right? I told right, my partner about three months ago that I was going to give her a gift and I was going to lose 20 pounds. A dumb thing to do. There was no way I could do it. I couldn't do it. Then my board chair, a guy named John Mackey, who's Mr. Foods. Um, he's the Whole Foods guy. Right? He's a grocery. He started this thing, Whole Foods. So John made me a $1,000 bet right, that I couldn't lose 20 pounds. Now, then my male ego was kind of <laughs> aroused. I'm going to fucking lose that bet. So I, so I won the bet. Right? But you know, and as I told John, I need help to win this bet. Yeah. Now, it could be I sh you know, for a different partner, I might have gained 20 pounds. It's not about losing or gaining. It doesn't matter what it is. It, it means that I'm willing to make a huge effort right, to meet my partner right, in a thousand different ways. So we should all meet each other. Right? We should all be willing to play within the context of our own integrity. Right? At the same time, right, we also got to take responsibility for our own arousal. And that single sentence literally changes the game. Changes the game. So totally appreciated, Mary Beth. Thank you for, for bringing us back there. Total, total. Total, total. Maybe last question. Cheap seats in the back. Give us a name. Mary. Mary. How could society change if this view of love that we're talking about, you know, comes to play? You know, I love listening to you talk. <laughs> um, and the way you answer questions, and I'm learning and hearing a lot of things. And um, you answer. Ay, ay, ay. Is it, you okay with that? Yeah, I, I just, I just want to say something really just vulnerable for a second. Um, and just give Stuart just a big, big, like heart open kiss. My whole life, since I'm 20, I started teaching when I was 20, it's 30 years ago. And I started teaching in Manhattan and within deep in kind of the Jewish Orthodox world. I was raised as an Orthodox rabbi and kind of that's where I kind of grew up. Until I was 22, 23, I pretty much didn't talk to anyone who really couldn't read with master in Aramaic text because I really didn't know what we would talk about, <laughs> right? And, you know, and I, I broke with that world in a series of stages for a lot of reasons. And in the end, started this, you know, world spirituality movement with my buddy Ken, with Ken Wilbur. But one of the deep pains in my life, and it's been actually exceedingly painful, is dealing with jealousy from other teachers. I'd come to a conference, it would go well, right? And the other teachers would look at me with a big smile and literally darts in their eyes. And you, I could feel it in my body, you know? And I've, I've actually suffered enormously as a result of that phenomena, you know, in very deep ways that have affected my life dramatically. And for Stuart, with all of his huge accomplishment, with his wisdom, with his depth, which is self-evident and obvious, what he's done in core energetics, to just have the gorgeousness to say, hey, I, I want to hear what you say. But nothing to, it's just, it's such a level of depth and beauty that I just want to cry and I can only just kiss the ground. So just like big, big kiss. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Thank you. What was the question? <laughs> I got it. I got it. So Mary says, how does, how does this change society? Right? And we'll, we'll close with this, then we'll spend just a couple of minutes on the Integral Evolutionary Tantra School and, and call it a night. And I want to give you a real answer. So I want to just kind of just give me a couple of steps, OK? Why do our hearts shut down? Why do we shut our hearts? Shame and fear. 
Why do we shut our hearts? Shame and fear. What else? Trauma. 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 Why else? Rejection. Rejection. So we shut our hearts because of shame and fear. Trauma. Rejection. What else? Reaction. Reaction. Right? Culture. Say it again. Enculturation. Enculturation. Let, let me ask the question a little differently. I'm completely with everyone. Why do, when we see a picture of Rwanda and its brutality, or we, we see Biafra, I remember when Biafra happened. Who remembers Biafra in Bangladesh? Remember that? Right? You see Cambodia, right? We see Tiananmen Square. We see it for a second, we read it, we move on. Why do we shut our hearts? Because it's too painful. Sandy says it's too painful. It's too painful. So so what happens? So if Stuart and I have an argument. Right? Let's say we're spending a lot of time together on an island and we have an argument. So we're going to go into that argument. We're going to feel the fullness of it because we know there's enough love between us. There's enough love in the room to heal it. So we're willing to feel because we have the capacity to heal. The reason we shut our hearts is because the gap between our ability to feel and our ability to heal is so great that we can't risk leaving our hearts open because we'll be crushed. Now, stay with me one more second. It's just so important. And just the last six weeks, I've been thinking about this kind of day and night. So I'm just kind of going to share it with you, and it's raw. For the first time in history, this has never been true before, we are assaulted with images of pain and suffering from all over the world that we have no genuine ability to affect at least not in any obvious way. That has never been true in the history of reality. And if you lived in Nepal a thousand years ago, you dealt with, I mean, the people on your block with the Nepal, whatever, whatever that meant. All of a sudden, we are God. We're God in the sense that we're omniscient. We're all knowing. CNN tells us in real time what's happening everywhere in the world, but we're omniscient without being omnipotent omnipotent, right? So we're actually omniscient and impotent. You get that? So the old image of divinity was knows all, has infinite power. We now know almost everything, and we're powerless. We're impotent. So when you're impotent, you're traumatized. When you're impotent, you're shamed. And there's actually, I think, and this is just formulating, in the last six weeks, I'm literally dreaming about this every night. I'm trying to kind of get it to, so we can kind of Right? We are literally experiencing a global trauma of impotence. Right? There's a global trauma of shame. Right? And shame is ultimately rooted in the sense that I'm bad. I'm bad because I'm not making it good. And I don't know how to make it good. How can I make it good? So the gap between the ability to feel and the ability to heal has become so great in this world of massive knowing and in impotence that we close our hearts. So what do we do? How do we respond to it? So three minutes. So I think there's a clear, powerful response. A and here it is. So step one, I'm just going to go six steps with you, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna, part of what we're going to do tomorrow is talk about this. Step one, the only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. outrageous love. Okay, we live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. Step one. Two, what does that mean? That means I should walk the path of the outrageous lover. Three, what does an outrageous lover do? Four, an outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. <laughs> Five, which outrageous acts of love should I commit? There's a lot to choose from. Six, commit the outrageous acts of love that are yours to commit and yours only to commit. Seven, how do I know which ones they are? Eight, answer one question. Nine, which one? <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Ten, the question of who are you? Eleven, who are you? Twelve, you are an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence and love beauty that is the initiating and animating eros of all that is. You are, 12 repeated, you are an irreducibly unique expression. No extras on the set. You're an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence and love beauty 
that is the initiating eros and animating eros of all that is. <laughs> Meaning, 13, that love intelligence has outrageous acts of love that can only be committed by you. 14. <laughs> and therefore, there's a corner of the world which will remain unloved if you don't commit your acts of love. And now here's the key. And all of this was to get us to 15. Now here's 15. How many people in the room have ever seen an anthill? Anthill? Okay. There's a famous book by E.O. Wilson, right, on kind of the, the you know, how, you know, anthropologist on, on ants and how ant hills organize. How many people in the room have ever been hiking and seen a slime mold? Slime mold, not less, but how many people, one person? One, two, three, four. So a slime mold, it kind of looks like somebody threw up on a log, <laughs> but it's actually a slime mold. And if you actually photo that, now you've already seen one of those, if you actually <laughs> photograph it and watch it over seven or eight days, you'll see that the slime mold cells literally disappear. They all go in different directions. Then two days later, they reorganize perfectly. How does that happen? Who organizes an anthill? So we used to think it was the queen ant. It's not. We used to think 30 years ago there were pacer cells, like a king cell, giving orders to the different slime mold cells, making it all work. Not. A guy named Turing, the Turing test in artificial intelligence, was the code cracker in World War II, who actually died in Manchester, England. Tragic story, because he was gay. He had a short affair with someone. The good old English, Manchester police, arrested him forced him to do estrogen treatment, and he committed suicide. He's the most brilliant mind, probably, of the last 50 years writing computers. And he wrote a paper called Morphogenesis. And that paper, Morphogenesis, was the key paper in defining what we're now calling self-organization. Meaning, the way an ant organizes is, there's an inherent intelligence. And what the ant does is, the ant looks around and says, and this is how the literature talks about it, the ant looks at what's called street level, and the ant looks and says, what's my neighbor or five neighbors doing? And then the ant responds to the need established by the ants right around him or her. That creates a self-organizing intelligence that organizes the ant hill. Now actually, the way our organs grow in our bodies, right, the way cities develop, right, the way ant hills develop, right, the way all life develops is through a self-organizing process Without, there's not an external God out there saying, this is the way it should happen. The, actually, the love and intelligence is inherent in reality itself. So there's a self-organizing intelligence. Now imagine this, and this is so fucking gorgeous, that it just, <laughs> it just defies, right? We're living in a world where there's finite resources. There's so many problems. But there's an infinity of creativity. And actually, if every human being lives their unique self, and at street level becomes an outrageous lover and addresses the unique <laughs> need right, in their circle of intimacy and influence, you actually create a unique self-symphony that has the power, the energy, the intelligence, the drive, the awake love to actually solve tenfold over every problem that confronts us today. It's not top down. We have to actually shift the essential model and I'm literally dreaming about this every night the last six weeks, and I'm so glad you asked it. We have to shift the essential model of how society is organized. We think there's somebody in some room, some place, in some corporation or government who's going to solve it. It's just not true. It doesn't exist. So therefore, we have to actually take responsibility and say, I'm the God particle. I'm the God particle. Right? The evolutionary impulse of love intelligence awakens in me. Evolution awakens to itself as me, being an outrageous lover, committing the outrageous acts of love that are mine and mine only to commit. There's no way in the world that I could have contributed to core energetics what Stuart has contributed in the last 25 years. Couldn't do it. No matter what I did, how I would have tried, right, his massive contribution and right, actually opening up a conversation, creating original exercises and practices, writing, right, counseling, moving a million things in the world. Had I tried to do it, it would have failed flat. Would have completely failed. Good, I'm good. Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but that's actually completely true. And once I get that, Stuart and I get to love each other because we're not trying to live each other's unique selves. 
And we can actually delight in each other. And you can actually have a model of two men who are not having a subliminal ego fight as they talk to each other politely, which is what happens in 99% of public dialogues. Because I've done a million of them. And this one's so rare, I can't even tell you. Right? But that's what unique self is about. That's what it means to be an outrageous lover. So number 15 is a unique self symphony of outrageous lovers committing outrageous acts of love and the end is in the beginning and the beginning is in the end and fucking the world open to God, right? And so it is, let it be so. So, yeah. let me tell you why I like to hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> First, you have so much eros for what you say. But I want to tell you how I would answer that question. <laughs> I would say that the, the reason we close our heart is to protect ourselves from pain. And then I would say that it's our nature, really, at the bottom, to love. Now, that's all I would have said. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Now, you said it uh, in, a, in a, I mean, I th it, 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 in a certain way, it's the same thing, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> I love what you said and how you say it, and it, it makes me smile, and it makes me say, wow, you know, I mean, I, I don't have that many words in me. <laughs> 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 But, yeah. it's, but you have a way of putting it together in a way that I think not just reaches people, but there's a passion and an eros in it that um, even if in some ways it's a little f a couple of words too many for me, I think, I think the energy of it and the essence of what you say re reaches me on a deep level. And that was what happened when I took a workshop with you of how I ended up feeling and leaving and why I fell in love with you. Thank you. Well, I, I fall in love with you in every possible way. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, and just as we close, you know, I want to say that content matters, right? Content matters. But actually, we've got to reclaim the body. We've got to reclaim the heart. We've got to reclaim the mind. Right? We can't think our way out of any problem, but we can't feel our way out of any problem and we can't embody our way out of any problem. We need all three. Right? My teacher once said that there's three kinds of emunah, three kinds of faith, trust. There's the trust of the mind, or the faith of the mind. There's emunah talev, the faith of the heart. And then there's the faith that lives in your toenails. <laughs> it's, it's in your body, right? So the integral evolutionary tantra school where I'm privileged to be the, the wisdom teacher in residence directed by Christina, by Christina Kincaid, is really a, a new division of our Center for World Spirituality, which is going to be really focused on the evolution of love, the evolution of Eros, and really dealing with sexuality, right, dealing with you know, all the issues that came up, and dealing with Christina's beautiful question over here. That's the kind of question we want to talk about, right? Mary Beth's question, right? Mary. Right, Rachel, you know, all through the room. And we're very, very hopeful that Stuart's going to take an active role, right, in kind of teaching and I being am. with us, oh, yeah, which would delight of us, which would be awesome. Right? And we'll work, of course, together with our friends at Core Energetics and, and with everyone. And everyone's really invited to take a role. And so if you'd like to, you know, step up, I'd really ask you not to wait to kind of find us tomorrow, but Cynthia has a little chart back there. And if just say I'm interested in getting involved and volunteering and helping in some way, Christina has really borne the weight of an enormous amount of work in the last three months by kind of putting this kind of thing together. And she's really forming a team. We're also going to start an, a kind of elite course, elite in the sense of a small group of people for a year, you know, 25 people, that would like to actually give a full vision of the teaching step by step to. So it'll be a year long course. We'll be talking about it tomorrow. So if you're interested in either in the year-long course or if you're interested in stepping up right, and being involved, right, you know, let us know, you know in a thousand ways. The course will involve an enormous amount of embodiment, an enormous amount of kind of deep thinking, an enormous amount of work together in dyads. And I hope that you know, when we finish the year, you'll have a kind of deep vision that will empower you, you know, as an outrageous lover, to do everything that only you can do, that I can't even dream of doing. You know, that really the purpose of this school of integral evolutionary tantra 
right, is to actually begin a particular note in this unique self symphony right, that we, we need so desperately. So I want to invite everyone, finally, right, to be with us tomorrow. Tomorrow is not going to be, although there'll be Dharma, there'll be some talking, but it's a big, big day of embodied exercise. And we're going to kind of weave together kind of pieces of Dharma with an enormous amount of embodied kind of core energetic practice led by Christina. We're going to be talking about, you know, everything. It's kind of a huge, huge, huge workshop. Right? If you're not signed up there, again, we're pretty much full, but I think we could squeeze five more people. And I know we had a little argument of whether we could do that today. Christina said we're not, but we decided together that maybe we could, <laughs> you know, five more people. So we, I think we have room maybe for five more people. Cynthia, maybe just raise your hand again. She's in the back there. Christina's here. So if you'd like to come, you're completely welcome. And most of all, just a deep bow to all of you, right, to everyone who's here, right, for coming. Deep bow to the center of the room.